before I hand over to our first speaker, I have some very important messages. So kia ora koutou, morena. Uh, in the event of fire, please evacuate the venue via the same way you came in and follow the instructions of the security staff and the wardens and assemble outside Seddon statue just on the front lawns. Please take care around the cameras and other equipment. My phone just dinged. Uh, and look, I'll just let you know that later on in the morning we'll have a choir singing and they're going to do a quiet karanga outside, so that's not for us, it's for, for them to um, bring themselves together. In the event of a medical emergency, please don't call 111. Uh, inform security or the venue staff immediately. I'm sure there's a doctor in the house. Uh, security will manage any medical emer emergencies. Uh, in the event of an earthquake, drop, cover, hold until it stops. Stay away from windows and other obvious hazards and the security staff will give you instructions. On arrival, you're issued with a visitor's sticker. Please don't lose it because it's your only way out and we don't want you living here like some people in airports because you'll have to scan it at the glass gates as you leave. Toilet facilities for this hall are just at the end there, around the corner through the glass doors. All Parliament buildings are smoke-free. Uh, you'll have to go outside to Molesworth Street if you wish to smoke. And please switch your phones onto silent. And photos are permitted in the banquet hall only. Uh, the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, sorry, I'm saying it in the Spanish way. Wi-Fi is conference, not those little things on the sides that you've got on the pieces of paper, just conference, password, conference. And you'll note on the table there's information about um, we'd like to encourage you to tweet and uh, there's a couple of tweeting sites there. And also your Facebook sites, please, and share. We, we really want to make this a great celebration. So thank you very much for being all here. And I'm going to now invite Barbara Williams to the, table, uh, to the stage. Namihi o te ata, no mai haere mai ki International Women's Day, tēnā koutou katoa. On behalf of UN Women and Zonta International, I would like to welcome you all to this very special breakfast to celebrate International Women's Day 2018. I'm Barbara Williams, as Nolene said, President of the UN Women National Committee in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We're proud to be an organisation that supports women here and raise, raises funds for women and girls in the Pacific. I'd like to thank the Minister for Women's Affairs, Honourable Julianne Genta, for hosting our breakfast today and acknowledge Her Excellency the Governor-General, Dame Patsy Reddy, for, uh, and our keynote speaker, Right Honourable Helen Clark. Thank you. We're pleased to welcome today the High Commissioners for the United Kingdom, Can Canada and the Solomon Islands, and the ambassadors of the United States, Argentina, Mexico, France, and Indonesia, and members of parliament, Honorable Tracy Martin, Jan Logie, Me Mecca Faitiri, Maya Lubeck, Anahila Karangata'a Susiiki, and Nikki Wagner, and also the presidents of Zonta and the National Council of Women. We're always pleased to welcome school students on this occasion, Today we have 14 students from eight different schools. And a special welcome to the women's choir, Manawa Ora, who join us to sing their anthem, I Can't Keep Quiet, this year in Te Reo. We're thrilled this year for the first time, thanks to live streaming, that 150 groups, groups of women around New Zealand, um, from the treaty grounds of Waitangi to Suva in, the, in Fiji, are able to participate with us in this event, together with 130 guests in the, joining us via the live feed in the Grand Hall in this building. I acknowledge the generous contribution of the UN Women Empowerment Partner, ANZ Bank, for, this, uh, for making this live streaming possible. 125 years ago today, New Zealand became the first, this year, New Zealand became the first country in the world to give the women the vote. 
We led the world then, and we're doing so again with women as Prime Minister, Governor General, and the Chief Justice. And even more amazingly, it's not for the first time. I'd like also to take this opportunity to honour the courage of one extraordinary woman, Christine Bartlett, this year's New Zealander of the Year, for her long... <laughs> Christine um, Bartlett, for her long and successful fight for equal pay for female care workers. This year comes at a time of unprecedented global movement for women's rights. With the success of the Me Too campaign, which has alerted the world to the prevalence of sexual assault and harassment in the workplace. The women's movement, which once flourished around kitchen tables, play centres and plunket, is now, thanks to the internet, a truly global movement. Social media allows women to connect instantly with their sisters, battling for, to make progress around the world and offer them support. The challenge, though, is to sustain the momentum of these campaigns and to turn these social media moments into genuine social change that will end sexual abuse and empower women around the world. Before I invite Her Excellency to speak to us, I would like to draw, draw your attention to our programme. You will note that this year we have made some changes to our usual format, in part to accommodate live streaming of the event. After we hear Her Excellency, the Minister for Women, Honourable Julianne Genta, will speak, followed by the Women's Choir, Manawa Ora. We then break for 20 minutes for our breakfast, during which we will screen historical photos of our 125 years of suffrage. After breakfast, the Right Honourable Helen Clark um, will be presented with the International Honorary Membership of Zonta by New Zealand Governor Janet Hope. At the end of the presentation, we'll listen to a 40-minute conversation between Helen Clark and Dr. Jill Greer. The Zonta Wellington President, Sarah Barclay, will close the formal proceedings and the live feed. Your Excellency, we are honoured and privileged that you have once again graciously agreed to address us and to share in this event with us here in this hall and via the live feed with women in the Grand Hall and around New Zealand and the Pacific. Prior to becoming Governor General, Dame Patsy had a notable career as a lawyer, working in a variety of roles, but always with active involvement in promoting and supporting women. One of her last roles before assuming office was as the independent facilitator of the Joint Working Group on Pay Equity. I now invite Her Excellency, the Governor-General, Dame Patsy Reddy, to address us. Kia ora. Tēnā tātou wa hine mā, nu mai haere mai. E te perimia o mua, Helen, tēnā koe. Ina te kaupapa nui, he hapai mā tātou katoa. Thank you very much for inviting me back to speak at the Zonta Wellington and UN Women New Zealand's Breakfast. In this 125th year since women won their fight for the right to vote, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Yesterday at Government House, we launched the celebrations of that major milestone in the history of women's rights. Later in the year, we will celebrate the 19th of September when the enabling legislation was signed into law and the 28th of November when women voted for the first time in 1893. It's a particular privilege to share the podium today with Helen Clark, our first elected female Prime Minister, who's been such a powerful and inspirational role model for women all over the world. Under Helen's leadership, the UN Development Programme helped improve the status and well-being of millions of women in developing countries. Helen, we thank you for your steadfast commitment to feminist leadership and lifting the sights of so many women. Well, as they say, a week's a long time in politics. 
And last year has certainly been a long year in the history of women's rights. Since our last breakfast here in 2017, we have witnessed an unexpected but very welcome shift in the zeitgeist and a gathering mood for change. Gloria Steinem has likened the Me Too movement to a tidal wave, noting that what is profoundly different from past campaigns is the sheer number of people participating. It is now a majority movement. Christine Bartlett, uh, who Barbara mentioned previously, did secure this wonderful milestone in the battle for pay equity. She was named New Zealander of the Year and workplace harassment is firmly in the spotlight. We have a female Prime Minister once more, more women in Parliament, and a commitment to make it a family-friendly environment for the MPs who are mothers of young children. So there's real cause for optimism. However, as Sandra Coney noted here 12 months ago, history shows what can happen when a movement loses momentum. Entrenched behaviours become harder to shift. The pioneers who worked in anti-fascism, feminism or gay rights endured inertia, vilification and backlash, but their causes prevailed because enough people came to see that they were just. Many of us here have personally witnessed this process unfold in our lifetimes. We know that it's possible to shift mainstream thinking and establish new social mores, but it takes concerted and consistent effort. We've also seen the movement towards gender equity stall, sometimes through inertia and sometimes through lack of active support from women themselves. The challenge is to ensure that this time the momentum is not lost, that widespread and lasting societal change is secured for the next generation of women in New Zealand. We have a personal responsibility to contribute, as indicated by one of the themes of this year's suffrage celebrations, Whakatū Wahine, Stand Tall. Standing tall means doing what we can to change the messages playing in the heads of women and men about gender roles. It means confronting stereotypes, calling out people on casual sexism, and speaking truth to power. It takes courage to do this, but it has to be done. We have to keep going because the stakes are high. The rights, the health, the well-being of future generations of women. Just as importantly, when women are enabled, they and their families flourish to the betterment of our wider society. Gender equity must not be restricted to the privileged few. We have to make sure that all women, regardless of their ethnicity, religious affiliation, socioeconomic background, or sexual identity, have the chances they deserve to educate themselves, to be free of sexual abuse, to have control of their own bodies, to have access to all avenues of education and employment. Only then can we truly say that we are honouring the courageous women who fought for the vote, who tested and broke down barriers of entry into the professions, who became the first female doctors, pilots, firefighters, engineers and soldiers, who fought for childcare and equal rights within marriage, who campaigned to reduce violence and abuse. Everyone here today has influence. Let's use that influence and let's see where it can take us before the next International Women's Day breakfast. Let's see what we can personally achieve in our families, in our schools and communities, and in our workplaces to change things for the better for women. Let's be vigilant about identifying entrenched and discriminatory power structures. Let's make sure the ladders are in place for other women to come up and join us. Let's actively use our influence for good. Thank you.
um, Dame Patsy, uh, on behalf of everyone here um, and those listening or watching through the live stream process, I'd like to um, acknowledge your words and insights this morning. You've talked about the opportunity for each of us individually to stand tall and uh, for us collectively to move forward in what has been and will be a very important year for women's rights, the continuation of women's rights in New Zealand. Thank you uh, for your insights. I think uh, just one thing I would like to say is that we are very privileged in New Zealand um, to have such strong mod role models in public life, um, so you yourself are, are a real example of that, uh, but in our business community uh, and in our wider communities. So we are very privileged to live in, in a country um, where we are able to achieve this. Um, and each of us, as I say, individually can take a stand and collectively work together. So thank you very much for your words this morning. Uh, we'd also like to just um, pass over um, the, uh, some yellow roses. So the, the yellow rose is a, son, a, a symbol of Zonta and it represents empowerment and courage. And uh, for us, that is what you stand for. So thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, our Minister for Women, Julie Ann Genta. Since taking up that role um, following last year's election, Julianne has been actively advancing women's issues on a number of fronts, but particularly in the area of pay equity. Julianne hails from Los Angeles, um, where her interest in women's and civil rights was first stimulated. Uh, her career in the transport sector gave her first-hand insights into working um, in an area that's um, dominated by men um, or a male environment and uh, has uh, given her the passion to address the barriers that women face in these sorts of environments. Julianne is also the Associate Minister for Health and the Associate Minister for Transport and sees the connections between her portfolios as providing an, um, important opportunities for improving women's lives and, in fact, all our lives. Please join me in welcoming the Minister. Thank you. E aku rangitira, tēnā koto katoa. Ka nui te honore ki te mihi ki a koto. Very warm welcome to you all. It's such a treat to be speaking to this breakfast just one day after the launch of our Suffrage 125 events and celebrations yesterday at Government House. I'd like to thank UN Women and Zonta for hosting us today. I'd particularly like to acknowledge the Governor General, Dame Patsy Reddy, former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, and all my fellow members of Parliament who are here this morning, and all of those who aren't in the room right now but are watching on live stream. It's wonderful to have you join us remotely. I'm especially honoured to be here in this role as Minister for Women. International Women's Day allows us a moment to celebrate the women who have gone before us, the sacrifices that they made, the work that they put in, and the victories that they enjoyed. Women around New Zealand collected thousands of signatures, cajoling and convincing their neighbors, and signing in secret in at times from their husbands to ensure that all women in this country could vote. It is 125 years since women organized and fought for their human right to vote, and Aotearoa led the world in women's rights. While we acknowledge this historic achievement, and how far we have come as the first country in the world where women could vote, it's also time to build a more inclusive and fair society together. In the first 100 days of this new government, we extended paid parental leave, and we committed to enacting law to enable women to achieve pay equity. 
course, it's not the government alone. I must acknowledge the important role that unions have played and will continue to play in achieving fair pay and working conditions for women in particular and for all people. And in that light, I must acknowledge the bravery um, and the wonderful achievements of our New Zealander of the Year, Christine Bartlett. We are working hard to further our efforts in domestic and sexual violence, as well as sexual harassment. My colleague, Jan Logie, the Undersecretary, Parliamentary Undersecretary for Sexual and Domestic Violence, is, leading a work, um, is the first person to hold a role for government specifically oriented towards achieving progress on reducing and eliminating sexual and domestic violence. As Dame Patsy said, the Me Too campaign continues to elevate women's voices and insist on change to how women are treated. Women have the right to not put up with this behavior. We have been kept silent for far too long, and time is up. I am proud of our values as a society, but there's more that we must do together. I wish the opportunities presented by the anniversary this year to further build better lives for women and girls. I want a world where gender equality is achieved, where society is free of entrenched gender norms, and where women and girls can achieve their potential. This responsibility lies with all of us. We must do better to ensure that all women get to enjoy the rights and privileges that we may take for granted. There must be greater attempts to address inequality, particularly for Maori and Pacifica women. I ask you to continue the work of ensuring that women and girls in New Zealand get a fairer deal. Whether it is encouraging a younger woman to ask for a pay rise, supporting a trans woman in, ac in accessing the health care she is entitled to, breaking down the barriers for women with disabilities, supporting migrant and refugee women to have the same opportunities that everyone born in Aotearoa has, or fostering a sense of belonging in our women's movement so that everyone feels welcome. There's much work for us to do. We need to continue to talk to our boys and men about a fair society, informed consent, and respectful relationships. Next week, I will be at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women in New York. I look forward to representing the New Zealand government's commitments to improving the lives of New Zealand women at this forum. I will take with me the stories of our women leaders who we honor here today. I wish you all a wonderful International Women's Day, and I hope you take this opportunity to learn from the many inspirational women gathered here. Fakatu wahine, Stand tall and proud. No reira, tanakoto, tanakoto, tanakoto kato. I'd like to uh, thank the Minister for her inspiring remarks. And I think we're very fortunate to have a Minister for Women who's not only a proud feminist, but has an ambitious agenda for gender equality in New Zealand, including dealing with the intractable problem of sexual harassment. So, Minister, thank you very much. I'm Sue Kedgley from UN Women New Zealand, and it's my great pleasure to introduce a women's choir called Mana Waora, who are going to sing the Toreo version of I Can't Keep Quiet, a song that's become something of an anthem of the global women's movement ever since it was performed at a women's march uh, several years ago. After the Waiata, there's going to be this 20-minute breakfast break, and uh, then we're going to have the conversation between Dr. Uh, Jill Greer and Helen Clark. But I'd like to just take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the literally thousands of women all around New Zealand 
who are sharing this event with us today uh, by remotely by the wonders of modern technology in homes and in uh, workplaces all around New Zealand, even in Fiji, we've got a group watching there, and your participation is making this a truly special occasion. Wonderful to have 150, probably about 180 groups all over New Zealand uh, with us today. Thank you, and we can almost feel your presence with us here today. Now, you're all very welcome to send in your feedback via Twitter, uh, and it's a hashtag IWD2018 Breakfast Parliament, uh, and we will try and show as much of your feedback as possible uh, during uh, the live stream. Now, please welcome the wonderful, the wonderful uh, well, women's choir, Mana Waora. Thank you.
just to let you know that we will be restarting in a couple of minutes. So thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed your breakfast. Ina mana, ina rayo, tina koto kata. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of Zonta, particularly on International Women's Day. I've been asked to talk a little bit about what Zonta International is. Zonta is a global organisation of professionals empowering women worldwide through service and advocacy. I had a wee Google on vocabulary.com and they describe to empower as to give someone the authority or power to do something and said it often refers to helping someone realise their abilities and potential, perhaps for the first time. In empowering women, Zonta projects are best described as giving women a hands up rather than a hand out ensuring they have the skills and knowledge to secure the basic necessities of life, increasing their self-esteem and their self-worth. Zonta has a long and well-respected history of partnership and programs with United Nations agencies and maintains consultative, <coughs> excuse me, consultative status on women's issues with the United Nations and Council of Europe. Internationally, Zonta clubs provide more than five million US dollars each two years in support of service projects and education programs to empower women and expand their access to education, health care, economic opportunities and safe living conditions. Our current international service projects include a partnership with the United Nations Population Fund established in 2008 to eliminate obstetric fistula in Liberia and supporting UNICEF in Madagascar with the Let Us Learn program to educate girls and improve the quality of the teaching. Zonta International strategies to prevent violence against women include in Niger, Zonta supporting an initiative to delay early marriage and early pregnancy for adolescent girls. This is part of a five-year program that focuses on improved health and education so girls know their rights they are safer and less exposed to violence. And in Nepal, working with UN Women to create sustainable foundations for addressing, for addressing human trafficking and unsafe migration of women and girls. Our education programs include the Amelia Earhart Fellowships for women studying aeronautical sciences or engineering. The Jane M. Klausman Women in Business Scholarships which encourage undergraduate women to enter careers and seek leadership positions in business-related subjects. And the Young Women in Public Affairs Awards, which encourage young women to participate in public affairs by recognising a commitment to the volunteer sector, evidence of leadership achievements and a dedication to the mission of Zonta. In New Zealand, Zonta members have been actively working to empower women both locally and globally for over 50 years. Our national project for the past four years has been supporting the Sophie Elliott Foundation's Loves Me Not program in schools. And in July, we start a new relationship with the Perinatal, <coughs> perinatal Anxiety and Depression, Aotearoa. Recognising that women are a key agents of change, 
the Zonta vision is a world in which women's rights are recognised as human rights and every woman is able to achieve her full potential. The Zonta International Board awards lifelong international honorary memberships to individuals who have helped to change societal attitudes about women or who have improved conditions for women beyond the national level. The Right Honourable Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and former Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme and Chair of the United Nations Development Group, was awarded honorary membership in Zonta in July 2017. As we've heard, Helen Clark was the first, elected, first woman elected as Prime Minister of New Zealand, serving three successive terms from 1999 to 2008. Prior to her role as Prime Minister, she had an extensive parliamentary and ministerial career. She also served as Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme and Chair of the United Nations Development Group, a committee consisting of the heads of all United Nations funds, programs and departments working on development issues. She was the first woman to hold these positions. Her work in advocating for inclusive and sustainable development and full inclusion and empowerment of women in development, as well as her advocacy efforts to end violence against women align with Zonta International's mission. She joins, <coughs> she joined, <coughs> excuse me, she joined, 40 women who Zonta has recognised for their significant contributions to advancing the status of women worldwide, including, including Dame Sylvia Cartwright and Dr Marilyn, Marilyn Wearing. We're also privileged to learn that Ms Clark will be attending the 64th Zonta International Convention in Yokohama, Japan, later this year. It's an honour for me to be able to present this honorary membership on behalf of the International Board at this International Women's Day event, along with the story of Zonta for the first 50 years, a book entitled Empowering Women, A History of Zonta International in New Zealand, 1965 to 2016. So, Ms. Clark. Governor General, uh, Minister of Women's Affairs, uh, uh, President of uh, Zonta in New Zealand, and everybody who's gathered for the breakfast. I'm going to have quite a lot to say shortly, so just a, a brief uh, word of thanks to uh, Zonta International. And I do look forward to coming to Yokohama to the uh, International Conference at the end of, end of June. Um, and thank you for the, the recognition, but truly it's, it's been my pleasure. I've had a life of being able to advocate uh, for and work for many causes, including gender equality, and it's it's been a privilege, not not a, not a burden, and I I'm very happy to have made a modest contribution in some way. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite Dr. Jill Greer to join Ms. Clark uh, for the, the main event. Um, Jill is the Chief Executive of the National Council of Women of New Zealand. Uh, she was previously the Chief Executive of Volunteer Service Abroad and New Zealand Director General of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. She has represented New Zealand, civil society and all volunteering at the United Nations on Development and Human Rights and has a background in strategic leadership. So um, Jill and Helen are going to have a conversation. And we'll set up over here. I had a practice run. <laughs> 
<laughs> Morena, kia ora, and thank you very much indeed. This is the third time that Helen and I have been able to have a conversation like this. I have to say it's the first time perched up on bar stools that we've done it. <laughs> it does feel slightly precarious. You okay there? Oh yes, I'll swivel around a little. She's a mountaineer, that's what we're not supposed to do. We're not allowed to swivel. I've been given strict instructions. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a real pleasure and a privilege for me to be here, particularly alongside Helen, uh, but I want to acknowledge the Governor-General, the Ambassadors, the Minister, members of Parliament, other Ministers, all of you here, the people sitting across in the Grand Hall. How fantastic on International Women's Day that we're all here and there are 165 others scattered around the country. And when you think about it, Helen, we're the first in the world to celebrate International Women's Day. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that just as it should be? <laughs> Not only the first to give women the vote, and very soon, in a few hours, there'll be people waking up across the Pacific in their villages. And I drove past once with some BSA volunteers, and we heard people singing. And so we stopped the bus, and we got off and we walked across this little village and a woman came over to us and we whispered, is it a church service? She said, no, no, it's International Women's Day. <laughs> and so across the world, as you will know, women will be gathering with some men. And of course, we can't do this without men because that's part of the journey with us and all of those stereotypes and attitudes and norms we talk about, they impact on all of us. So, it's a real pleasure and it's a great uh, opportunity to think about International Women's Day. And my understanding is that it began, um, and the minister may be interested in this, it began in New York in 1908, when women protested, 15,000 of them marching down the street, calling for the vote. They wanted to be like the women of New Zealand. <laughs> and in some countries, it's a holiday. In some countries, even better, it's a holiday only for women. Now, I don't know what power the Governor-General has. <laughs> Could we perhaps give that some thought? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure with a woman Prime Minister and a woman a Governor-General and others in those very important key positions, that should certainly be possible. But perhaps we better think of more serious things and it's not a holiday and you all have places to go. Helen, we've talked this morning, people have talked very articulately about what an extraordinary year this is. How do you feel, Thank you. on International Women's Day, how do you feel the place of the women, of women in the world is today? Where are we globally? How do you feel we are at home? Well, thank you, Jill, and good morning, everyone. Uh, of course, we have our bubble here, our bubble here enables us to see women rise to the top of everything, right? At some point, women have led everything in New Zealand, whether it's the three women PMs, the three women Governor Generals, our long-serving Chief Justice, women have been the head of the, the biggest company, they've been the Speaker of Parliament, the, the Cabinet Secretary, the head of the Law Society, the Medical uh, Association, the Accountants, you, you name it, women have done it. Now, not yet regularly enough, enough of a number of those positions, but you know, we have shown that you can crash through glass ceilings in New Zealand. Not saying it was easy uh, for the generation that was doing it first, but, but we did it. The society was open enough for, for that. Now, uh, secondly, uh, we've made you know, quite a lot of progress on enabling women to have the genuine choice of combining family and career, which is extremely important. You know, when we had the bigger gender pay gap, it was very much related to the fact that women were taking those years out uh, with family, which, uh, because there really wasn't an alternative, and those were lost years. So as men had their steady career progression, uh, women never could get back in to, to catch up with that, uh, that age group of, of, of male uh, cohort. Um, so, you know, we've come away, we still need to do better. I think it's an incredible signal that our Prime Minister says, well, by the way, I'm having a baby and I'm carrying on doing my job. Isn't that what women do all over the country? So, good honour. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I don't know what's happening in that cabinet, but the Minister of Women's Affairs is always also having a baby and she's going to carry on doing her job as, as well. 
so this is, this is good. I think what is important is to make the combination possible for women at all income levels. I see a lot of stress on young, on young family women now, and I was reflecting as we talked to Janet uh, over, over breakfast that when I was a child and my mother needed to drive from the farm uh, into the local city 20 miles away for things. My grandmother was down the road and we could be dropped off with my, with my grandmother. Now, in our multi-generational families, the grandmother is as likely to be doing the grandchildren stuff as well as the parental stuff. My, my sisters with grandchildren also have 96-year-old dad. My dad is 96 today, by the way, International <laughs> Women's <laughs> Day. <laughs> very, very proud dad. So, you know, we just have to make sure that we keep moving towards the gold standard of the Scandinavian countries on support for families, for men and women with children, and combining these things, these very important social responsibilities of bringing up the next generation, with the ability to contribute according to one's talents uh, in the wider life of the economy and society. Helen, you've always turned to the Scandinavians, I think, mm. as a model, and, and rightly so. But you just mentioned two key members of parliament. When you came into parliament, there were eight women members of parliament. Now, out of 92. <laughs> yes, out of 92. Mm. That can't mm. have been easy. Now mm. there are 38% of mm. parliamentarians mm. Are, are women. Why does that matter? Why does the number of women in parliament matter? Because visibility is given to issues and perspectives uh, uh, around women's interests and perceptions, which wasn't possible before, frankly. Uh, I, I do remember coming here uh, in 1981, I was elected. The numbers doubled from four to eight. Some men were unkind enough to say that the place was being taken over by women. <laughs> and I remember uh, Sir Robert Muldoon in his valedictory speech when he finally retired. Uh, <laughs> When he was asked what had changed most in his years here, he said all those women being elected. Uh, the numbers were really quite small, and I often you know, refer to coming into this boys' club. This was a boys' club, and there were three forms of recreation. One exercised this muscle at the bar, another exercised this muscle at the billiards room, uh, and then there were the card muscles for the poker schools. Well, I didn't do any of those things. So, you know, you had to, as the numbers of women grew, really change the culture around the place. Actually, one of the triumphs was when billiards went so out of fashion that it was cleared out of what is now the Grand Hall, which is a beautiful meeting space. But it used to be occupied by four large billiards tables. So that's a change, the sign of the change of our times. And one more little story about that. Uh, because the women generally didn't play billiards, uh, but they thought there should be some space in the billiards hall for us. They put up a little curtained area in the far back corner where you could sit and have a cup of tea. It's amazing what you heard when you sat behind those curtains. <laughs> I don't think any of us will ever look at billiards in quite the same way. <laughs> so I think a number of things come out of that. One, mm. you get the policy mm. and the funding and the laws that drive change when there are women in Parliament. It's different, isn't it? It is different, and there is international you know, experience and studies around this that when the numbers of women get to a critical mass, you start to get some issues addressed. You get more attention on, on domestic violence, uh, you know, support for single parents. A, a lot of things start to happen that just didn't have visibility before. Helen, you mentioned before, growing up on the farm, and of course, when the minister and um, the head of the ministry and others go to New York in a few days' time for the Commission on Status of Women, which is always an exciting event. The subject this time is rural women. Did being a rural woman have much impact on you growing up in, a country, in the country? Do you think that helped to shape you? Yes, I do. Um, because you know, rural people have to be very resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you grow up on a farm, you're earning your livelihood really around the seasons. I mean, that's why I think rural people should take a great interest in climate change because that really affects the whole base of production. So you're very uh, weather dependent. Uh, you know, you're more likely to have your services go down when there's major storms. Uh, 
uh, your power supply easily cut on the long line. I mean, you just have to be very resilient growing up, at least in those days, in, in rural areas. And uh, I think that stood me in very good stead uh, through life as I, I you know, faced increasingly competitive environments. And you and I have touched on this before, mm. but going from that environment to boarding school, how was that? Did that help with resilience? Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, look, m many people have been, been away to a boarding school, but you know, when, when you are plucked from the little cocoon of your family on a, on a back road in a, in a rural area and you're sent to what was the top girls' school in Auckland to be one of a little minority of rural students, yeah, you have to be reasonably robust to survive that experience. And indeed you've shown us that in all sorts of ways, climbing mountains, whatever. But the theme for today, of course, is different. And it's, it's slightly odd, and I just have to look at it to get it absolutely right, to be honest. It's press for progress. Mm. So I guess it's about activism, it's about advocacy. Mm. What do you think are the most important things for us here in this room and across the country as women to be advocating for today? Well, the job isn't done, is it? Uh, I mean, you know, some people say, why do we have International Women's Day? Because the job is not done. Now, there was a very interesting graphic tweeted out of the UN in Geneva a few days ago, and it had a graphic of the proportion of women in you know, senior positions. And it went something like this. Heads of state, which is presidents and queens, right? <laughs> just over 7%. Heads of government, just over 5%. Jacinda is one of the 5% uh, who have made it uh, through right now. Uh, proportion of women members of parliament globally, 23.3%. Not the 38 we have or the 60% plus of Rwanda, but 23%. Uh, then it looks uh, at, uh, well, proportion of women permanent representatives to the UN in New York, 21%. And there are other figures on uh, the boards of the you know, top uh, 500 uh, companies, top 3,000 companies. It's under 20% membership of, uh, of boards which are, which are female. So these, these figures are not good. Now, every year, the World Economic Forum, based in Geneva, does a global gender gap report. And last year's report got a lot of attention because it showed negative trends on gender equality. It said we're slipping. Uh, and it forecast on the current trends that it would take 99 years for global gender parity in parliaments. Do we want to wait 99 years? And then it looked at overall trends in the, the workforce and workplace. It said 217 years to full gender equality. Now, this is completely unacceptable. Uh, so we need, I think, to focus on what are the barriers here and work to over overcome them. The other uh, issue which has had a lot of attention over the last few months and has now you know, got some traction in New Zealand as well is the Me Too movement where women have finally decided they've had enough. They're going to hashtag Me Too and they're going to say, you know, I was assaulted, harassed, bullied, etc., in the workplace by a guy <laughs> and I'm going to call him out. And it's had some spectacular scalps um, uh, ar around the world. And I think it's positive because, you know, often women haven't come out. They, they haven't complained. They've put up with it. But they're not going to put up with it anymore. And that's a step towards resolving uh, issues. If they're under the carpet, they'll, they'll never be dealt with. But they're not anymore. I absolutely agree. And I'm sure there's everyone here would agree. And, and there has been hurt and humiliation and silence for too long. And it is time, as the minister and others have said this morning, to say enough is enough. The question is how to make the changes. And certainly for us working in Gender Equal New Zealand, a campaign from the National Council of Women, the drive for us is to tackle the stereotypes, the norms that drive the unconscious and sometimes conscious bias uh, that are perpetuated and become part of us as children. So moving on from there a, a little, and to pick up exactly really on that, there was a survey done by a very reputable company last year, um, carried out by on Deloitte's on their behalf. 500 companies, um, five staff and more, uh, over 500. 
49%, and they were all managers and leaders who were interviewed, 49% said that the reason for the low number of women in leadership positions, so if we think we actually went down in the first quarter, for example, in terms of women on boards, we're sitting at about 14%. The state, state, state sector is stronger than the private sector. 49% said the reason for the lack of women in senior management leadership positions was lack of talent. Now, that lack of talent was in the sector, in the organization, and in women. It was broken down into those three pieces. So we have a long way to go. We do, and of course it's completely untrue. If you look for the women, the women are there. Uh, I used to chair the Cabinet Honours and Appointments Committee for, for nine years. And, you know, at an early stage, there would sometimes be recommendations for appointments to boards which would come forward and you'd look at them and say, well, where are the women? Please go away and come back with a better list. <laughs> and the Ministry of Women's Affairs, of course, has long had the, uh, the, the women's appointments file and the, the, the women are there. You might have to go and look because women uh, sometimes don't lean in the way men do to lobby for places on these things, but the women are there and they are talented. And in the commercial world, you now see report after report after report that says that the companies with the significant uh, women's representation, better gender balance on their boards and in their senior management are doing better commercially. I always say, if no other argument works, if people aren't impressed by the rights arguments, then go to economics, because it always stacks up. Yes. And mm. I have to say, there are a number of companies in New Zealand, I think, doing extraordinary work, mm. which is, is great to see. Mm. Going from there, and admitting that we have a great deal to do to finish the work that Kate Shepherd started, going from there to something she wouldn't have had to worry about. You mentioned climate change. Now, a few weeks ago, you gave a speech to launch something called the, let me get it right, the Planetary Health Platform. Now that to me sounds like Star Wars meets Shortland Street. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell us why a planetary health platform? Well, a University lot of... University of Sydney, yeah? Yes, yes, no, it was in Sydney. The University of Sydney has established the first chair in planetary health in the world, and the term was developed uh, by a commission uh, convened by the leading uh, health journal, uh, The Lancet, uh, based in the United Kingdom. And uh, they defined the concept of planetary health as, uh, it's really about getting that right balance of, of human development, advancing in health and protecting the environment. So what's the case that they make? Well, uh, the case is that, yes, we've made incredible advances in human health, and I'll put in brackets, human development uh, generally, uh, but our progress has been based on a completely unsustainable model when it comes to the use of natural resources. So we wreck our water supply, we wreck our, our air quality, uh, we take down our forests and affect our, our climate. You know, our, our traditional model of developing down through the ages has been taking from nature more than nature can in the end replenish. And what the commission found was that you, know, you get to a tipping point where actually you can't sustain the progress in health and human development because you're undermining the ability of the capacity, the capacity of the planet to supply the services that, that, that we need. Uh, so we're under stress. Look, take for a moment the example of Cape Town, which was due in mid-April to run out of water. Now, because people finally got the message, D-Day is now mid-July, and hopefully they'll keep getting the message and people will save on the water and not fill the swimming pools because the poor have never used much water, actually. There's a lot of issues of inequality in that as well. Uh, but if Cape Town completely ran out of water, what happens to human health? That's when cholera gets away, right? You look at where the cholera epidemics are. It's where the water supply has broken down. Sanitation's broken down. So if we come under severe planetary stress, it will affect our health. We'll start to go backwards. Uh, you look at uh, the warming climate, uh, you're now seeing uh, uh, conditions like malaria at much higher altitudes in the Andes than you ever saw before. Uh, so people who never had to deal with the problem of malaria are now having to deal with it much, much further uh, up up in height. Uh, so, you know, one, one could go on and on about the, the links between our health, our, our human development and progress, and the health of the planet. And that's why the, 
the global development agenda that was signed off by you know, the world leaders attending the UN summit in 2015 is the right agenda because it is about how do you get human progress, continuing human progress, without trashing the environment. We've got to get things into better balance. Look, this agenda is, is very large and very complex with 17 goals and 169 targets and over 200 indicators. Too much, too much. I could have written it much simpler to the same effect, but uh, member states negotiate these things. But it's the right agenda, it's the right vision, and we have to stick with it. So the Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030, mm -hmm. a vision of no one left behind. Yep. There's a challenge for equality. You led the development mm. of the Sustainable Development Goals, and what an extraordinary legacy mm. to leave the UN with and mm. to pass on to all of us. Mm. When you think about those 17 goals, they're supposed to be like human rights. They're supposed to be unalienable, indivisible. Mm. You can do them all. I don't think yet in New Zealand we have a very high awareness of the Sustainable Development Goals. But there's a conference here next year, I, just, I mean next month, I'll put in a plug for that. Mm. But it has the chance to make a difference. It really does, in spite of the size of the goals. Do you think there is any one goal in there, in spite of the idea that they're supposed to be seen together, that is critical to all of the others? Well, look, firstly, the, the agenda had many, many midwives. And uh, in the UN development system, we provided a platform for the world's public to have a say. There was a global survey called My World, and it listed, you know, all sorts of things that could be considered in the uh, new global agenda and ask people to give their top three priorities. What a surprise. It came in uh, health, education and jobs, you know, and all very close together. But interestingly, the fourth one that people picked around the world, irrespective of region, was more honest government. Now that actually says, look, all these goals are important, but a foundation for development is peace. You know? How do you get development in Syria today? Or Yemen? Or Somalia? Or Mali? Or, 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 or. there's a long list of countries in trouble. So you, you have to have peace. So what, what is peace based on? Well, peace is based on uh, inclusive and equitable societies where people have voice, where they can express their opinions, they have adequacy and sufficiency of, of means, and they have ways of decisions being made where people feel they, they've, they've had a say and, and they have constitutional processes to work through. So that means that while all goals are important, gender equality, health, education, you name it, you're not in the end really going to achieve in those areas and make them stick if the governance of a country is a total mess. And that's why uh, SDG 16 on building peaceful and inclusive societies uh, based on the rule of law is very important. And taking from that, you, you have been mm. one of the, the powerful mm. speakers. You've spent a lot of time since you left uh, UNDP promoting the goals, advising governments in all sorts of ways. And picking up then from that, and thinking a little bit about the current situation in which we find ourselves. You're a leader. Uh, when I saw the showing of the film A Year with Helen a few months ago, a young woman stood up the back and said, so if Helen can't do it, what chance have the rest of us got? You know, it's that if girls can see it, girls can do it again. Mm -hmm. And too often, they don't get to see it. You are followed by many, 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 many thousands on social media. Here in Wellington last night, a theatre packed again to watch that film. And yet I often speak at conferences of leadership for young women, and I say to them, they want to be leaders. They want it to be values-based leadership. They want to do it differently. And I say, so would you work for an NGO? Often the answer is no would you want to go into Parliament? And I never get a yes. Now that may change now with a new Prime Minister, a new Minister for Women's Affairs and many other women in Parliament and, and in a ministerial level as well. But what do you say? I mean, 
Donald Trump said, for example, that without the media, Helen Clint uh, Hillary Clinton would have been lucky to have been elected as a dog catcher. Um, when you hear things like that, or things were said to you, or you didn't get the position that you were brave enough to put your hand up for with great courage, how does it feel and what does it mean for those who come behind you? Well, f firstly, I think if you're going to go into uh, you know, workspaces which are very heavily contested, like politics, or putting your hand up for a top position at the UN, you have to be resilient enough to know that you can cope with losing. Because if you can't cope with losing, don't go near it. You know, life is full of you know, ups and downs. Uh, you know, I was 27 and a half years in this institution. Uh, 15 of those years were in the government party and 12 in opposition. That's not bad by the law of averages. Uh, now, you know, I had eight good years at the UN and the position that I did have. Well, the other one didn't work out. That's life. I actually have a very good life. <laughs> you know, I don't, don't sit around you know, looking back and thinking, uh, what if? So you have to be prepared to have a go and you have to be able to lose. Winning is always the easy bit. And I told a story after the film screening last night when uh, Lorraine Perry, my alter ego, was kind enough to be uh, <laughs> uh, the interviewer. And I said, what I learned in politics over the years was when you won, the phone never stopped ringing, right? Everybody wanted to talk to you. Um, when you lose, the phone goes very quiet. You keep thinking, have I left it off the hook? You know, <laughs> nobody's ringing. Because uh, they're busy you know, finding favour with the next crowd. So you know, this is life. Just be tough enough to deal with it. And I use tough. I mean, people often say, well, you don't like tough women. You've got to be tough. You've got to be resilient to get out there, you know, jostle your way in. Another of my favourite uh, aphorisms is, uh, you know, no one, women or men, should expect anyone to roll out the red carpet for them and open the door. You must roll out your own carpet and kick the door in if you really want something. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, let's not be shrinking violets. Sheryl Sandberg, the amazing, you know, chief operating person at Facebook, wrote a book all about women leaning in. She said, don't lean out, girls. No one's going to notice you. Lean in. You know, I'm available. I could do it. You know, look at me. And I think sometimes women are much more sort of, you know, facing, self-effacing. They don't push themselves out there quite, quite as much. We've got to get over that. We are as good. We can do as good a job. So let's make sure people are aware of that. So we in this room, and New Zealanders mm. across the country, are proud of you. Yeah. But they must ask themselves sometimes, mm. why? It takes courage to go into politics. I tried and failed, so <laughs> that shows that it's not easy too. Um, mm. You succeeded. Mm. You then put up your hand for Prime Minister. That mm. takes courage. Mm. Administrator SDG, huge courage. What a fantastic, powerful job. Mm. And then you put your hand up for Secretary General. Massive courage. What drives you? Is it what drives you to roll out the carpet and kick the door open or in? Is it what Gloria Steinem, who was mentioned before, mm. would call intelligent rage? I think I can make a difference, so that's what motivates me. You know, that uh, you, know, you, you could, through the position you hold, uh, get the issues that are important to you and to, you know, your country, uh, and in the global position to people everywhere, you could get them addressed. You could make a contribution to that. So that's what keeps me going. So the author of The Tribe talks about leaders as being people who paint a vision of the future so that others will follow. Mm. What would be your vision of the future? Well, my vision of the future would be that everyone should be born into a world where they have equal rights, they can take their education as far as possible, uh, fulfill their potential, uh, having that, that knowledge and the skills to cope in you know, a pretty challenging world out there, always have access to the services they need, uh, health, other kinds of social services, have access to work because you know, there is dignity in work and being you know, independent and, and self-reliant uh, where, where, where that's possible. And then you know, really a world where we don't continue to undermine uh, nature's ecosystems, which we are so dependent on. You know, the, the climate challenge comes from just you know, centuries, <laughs> millennia, of abusing nature. 
And we can't go on like that, or we undermine the basis for life on Earth. So, you know, I've got a vision which sees us get all this in better balance, and using the phrase you used from the, the global agenda, leave no one behind. Because where you leave people behind, you set up tensions, exclusions, uh, instability, lack of social cohesion. It, it's a negative cycle. We don't need that. The world doesn't need it. It's a big challenge to overcome that problem. It is. And last mm. year, when we mm. talked like this, mm -hmm. you had sent out a New Year's message which talked about the fact that we were in a world of volatility, mm. of disruption, disorder, and you said something that I have never forgotten, which is, but every small act can make a difference, and if there are enough small actions in the same direction, hopefully the right direction, then a huge amount can be achieved. I'm misquoting you, but that was the gist of it. In spite of what we have seen this year, in spite of climate change, and you have talked about us being in uncharted territory, mm. you have talked about us, my generation, mm. and yours, and those here, you have talked about us mortgaging the future of future generations. Do you still believe that enough small acts can make a difference? Oh, definitely. I think it all adds up. And when uh, uh, Janet was telling us a little about Zonta, uh, she talked about uh, a couple of the projects which Zonta International raises money for. Now, this is, you know, women in an international organisation, each giving a little to make a difference for girls in Niger. I've been to Niger. You know, I've seen the 16-year-old the, the mother in the, the feeding centre for victims of near famine, the 16-year-old mum who's got a two-year-old and a little baby. You know, this is, this is the reality of life for a lot of women. That girl should have been in school finishing her education, not a mum of two at, at 16. And so every little bit of kindness from a Zonta member who's raising money that can do something with a project like that is critical. You also mentioned fistula in, Li in Liberia. Uh, fistula, you know, something we don't have to put up with here, right? Because it would be fixed. But there are a lot of poor societies where women uh, have this happen and they become shunned. They have no access to an operation to fix the problem. Uh, they end up, of course, you know, exuding an odour. So you know, it's, 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 it's horrific for them and it leads to stigmatisation. If they can't get that operation, their lives are wrecked. And again, Zonta, many little acts by women around the world, contributes to the operations those women need. So you know, never think that your little bit doesn't make a difference. It makes a huge difference. You know, we can all contribute. I've had the ability to contribute at top levels, but everybody can contribute. It does add up. And I think that's a great note to add on, end on. It does add up. Yeah. Helen, I think it's been a huge privilege for all of us to be with you today. Mm. We're very proud of you. Kia kaha, kia manua nui, go well. Tonight it's Nelson, next week it's Manila. You take our best wishes with you all the way. I'd love to have had time to ask you, what do you read, what do you listen to, what do you watch when you're on those planes? <laughs> but in the meantime, just thank you so much from all of us and to everyone. May the sea be calm as Greenstone and the goddess of summer dance across your paths. Thank you very much indeed. Helen I'm Sarah Barclay, the president of the Zonta Club of Wellington. I know that when we work together, we make more of a difference than when we work alone. I'd like to acknowledge everyone that is here today. Like you, the members of the Zonta Club of Wellington work full time, and we organize events just like this breakfast today in our spare time. 
So I hope that this event today has inspired to you because I know a lot of you now have to rush off to work. Big thanks to Helen Clark and Jill Greer. Your words today were just so inspiring. Thank you also to Nolene Holt. So it was Nolene Holt's idea to organise the live stream event today and I think without Nolene's um, great ideas we wouldn't have reached as many people as we would otherwise. So I'd like you all to um, round of applause for Nolene. Zonta helps women in Wellington, New Zealand and globally too. Since Zonta was founded in 1919, Zonchans have been passionate about empowering women. And I'll give you an example. In the 80s in Rwanda, Rwanda was facing an HIV epidemic. In some parts of the country, up to 30% of pregnant women had HIV. And that meant that their babies were born with the disease too. So in 2008, Zonta International partnered with UNICEF and began a campaign to eliminate mother-to-child transmission of HIV. So this involved Zonta clubs around the world, um, as Helen said, giving a little bit of money and raising funds towards this important campaign together with UNICEF. And I'm pleased to tell you that now there is virtually no transmission of HIV from mothers to babies when they're born, which is a fantastic result in 10 years. Another interesting thing about Rwanda is it's one of the few countries in the world that has more women politicians than men. So thank you to everyone that has been watching online and I hope that you've been inspired today. For those of you that are in the room, when you leave today you'll be given a yellow Zonta rose. The yellow Zonta rose is more than just a beautiful flower, it also symbolises the importance of International Women's Day. So as I said before, when we work together, we make more of a difference than when we work alone. Thank you for coming today. Helen and the Governor-General uh, have graciously said that they can, they've got 10 minutes to spare if you want a photo with them, so I'll invite them up here. And remember to hang on to your sticker or you're stuck. Yeah. Yeah.